let's see. Where were we? Uh, I believe we just had the impulse momentum equation. Is that right? All right, we'll uh, I'll put that up more. Oh, dang it, I knew it. They put tape on the board. Uh, ruins the, makes it hard to write on. This is the fourth, or sorry, third of the three ways we solve kinetics problems, if you remember. Um, this one, like the others, comes directly from Newton's second law anyway, so it's not like they're different. They're just sort of recastings of the same thing that gives us a chance to, uh, to uh, solve different problems in slightly different ways. If I remember, this class uses G as uh, momentum, linear momentum. And remember, this is a full vector equation. So don't go throwing vector signs around in a haphazard way. It's, it's very definitely a vector equation. And I believe we did a problem where uh, we actually took this and then split it into the two component directions, the x direction and the y direction. Um, and it works uh, just like our others have for that, where, for example, uh, that we sum the forces in the x direction, and that will give us a change in x momentum. So it, uh, it uh, works very much like so many of our other vector equations. So we're going to take a little bit of a step beyond that, sort of add to it in much the same way. Um, if I remember, hang on, we did, uh, I guess we, we had an alternate form of this that I'll put down just for completeness, if I remember. Yeah, this was uh, also took this one, that the sum of the forces is equal to the time rate of change of that linear momentum. And in fact, uh, just divide through by dt and then integrate, and you get that one up there at the top. So they're really very much one and the same. This is really nothing than our, our first one, which is f equals ma. So we're going to go a little bit beyond that now. I add to it some. Um, from statics, if you remember, or Alex, you don't, but you remember uh, at least the first take on this from from uh, physics one. Um, we were a little more complete with it in in uh, statics, but the sum of the momentum uh, in in physics one we called that torque and used the symbol tau. So. Uh, it's just a slightly different notation. Um, remember, with respect to some particular point, remember what the sum of the torques was uh, in in statics, you fellas who did that. How we how we uh, calculated all the torques? Yeah, I wouldn't be here, huh? Well, yeah, uh, in the more complete form, it was actually a cross product. R cross, and then the sum of the forces, the R cross the net force on an object, where, remember, this R was the uh, location of whatever force it is we're talking about. <coughs> Bless you. Maybe the force is summed to give us that. And we had some point O, and R is the position vector locating that with respect to that uh, position O. So we had that as, as a full cross product. And uh, if you remember, the angle between those two, maybe we'll call it theta, then this has a magnitude 
of uh, R, well, yeah, let me write it that way. Just trying to think which is the clearest way to write it. The, this R, magnitude R times the sum of the forces R times the sine of that angle between them. And then since that's a full vector up there, this better be a vector here. Uh, so typically we, uh, uh, at least for the drawing given, would uh, use the right-hand rule then for that. And uh, so we have that as the magnitude of the sum of the forces, uh, sorry, sum of the moments. And then the direction is out of the board for, at least for that, that bit of a picture there. Maybe you also remember that the cross product actually gives you the area enclosed by those two vectors as well. I don't know if you remember that or not. That, that comes to be very, very useful in some of the other uh, uh, more advanced physics classes and engineering classes you're going to get to shortly. All right, so that's a little bit of review. Uh, Alex, when we did this, almost every single time these two vectors were perpendicular to each other, which made this 90 degrees, which meant that sine of 90 degrees was 1, and so it was just our uh, uh, distance times force, force times uh, moment arm, which is what uh, TJ gave us a second ago. So it's not terribly different from what we did in physics, just a little bit more uh, advanced, I guess. So. All right, hopefully that's just a quick reminder because what we want to do with it is this. Let's see, so that's, that's R cross and then the, the, that sum of the forces, let's see, that's MA. So that's MV dot. Same thing, that's just F equals MA pulling that in there. Now let's see what that second part means. It's actually, a, we, we sort of have to come to it in a roundabout way. Let's see, let's do this. Uh, let's take R cross MV And we'll take the time rate of change of that. We'll take that through, and then we'll connect these two, and we'll see what this what this business really is that we've got here. All right. Uh, this takes two parts. Um, doing the the derivative of a uh, product, the product rule. Uh, one part is r dot cross. MV. That's DDT of the R part, and then leaving the second part alone, as you do in the product rule. And then we leave the first part, oops, that's a R vector. Then we leave the first part alone and take DDT of the second part. That's good because that thing right there is that thing right there. That's why I did that. So we've, we've got an idea then on what the second part is, this R cross M A, if you will. Look at that first part, though. Second part we're going to use over there. But the first part, what's that? Anybody have any idea? What if I wrote it this way? Uh, R dot we know to be V. So this is R cross MV. Okay. Well, remember that uh, that the magnitude of the cross product, so let's see, V cross MV, that's 
those two vectors are parallel to each other because uh, m is just a, a multiplier and so the cross product of two parallel vectors is tj yeah. zero the cross product of two perpend uh, two parallel vectors is zero if they're perpendicular then the cross product is their uh, they're just simply their magnitudes because then the angle between them is 90. This time the angle between them is zero, the sine of zero is zero. So this whole first part here is zero itself because that's the cross product of two parallel vectors. That means that this piece here is the time rate of change of R cross M V. Let's see if we can get just a, a picture of that. So here's here's some uh, useful coordinate system. Some point serves as our origin. We've got some path here that our object can follow and there it happens. Well, let me put it there so the vectors lay a little bit better. So there's our mass. There's MV, its momentum vector. Here's R for that instant. So we have R cross MV. All right, we're going to define that's let's see that's that's the momentum as this object is moving past a particular point in some way, depending on where it is along that path. But as it moves past that point. That's its momentum with respect to that point. That is actually what we call the angular momentum. It is with respect to a particular point, which makes it a little less intuitive than linear momentum is. Linear momentum is just what it is. It doesn't matter where it is or where any origin is. But uh, angular momentum, a little less intuitive because it's different with respect to different places. But it's that cross product, that quantity R cross MD. And so, we then have the sum of the moments on an object it is the time rate of change of the angular momentum. And that looks very, very much like the sum of the forces we just had which was the time rate of change of the linear moment. And in fact, these two equations completely define the dynamics of a particle moving in space. Some of the moments is the time rate of change of the angular momentum. Some of the forces, time rate of change of the linear momentum. So they're both both very much the same type of idea, the same type of thing. Um, the units, let me 
meters, kilogram, meters per second. So what is that? Kilogram, we had two meters, meters squared per second. So something like that, or in the, another form, Newton, meter, seconds. Right? Add in the seconds on the bottom and take it back out on the top and end up with that. Okay, remember, with respect to, uh, to some particular point, for our two-dimensional problems, um, this will become rather easy for the most part. Uh, we don't have to do the full three-dimensional cross product. For our two-dimensional problems. Okay. So let's see. So we took this last time we were here and got from that's really remember just f equals ma. We got from that last time. the impulse momentum equation where the amount of time a force is being applied. Remember, that's the area under the force time diagram. Will be the change in the uh, angular momentum. And we also have now a, another part to this that we just developed and then it too leads directly to a form of the angular impulse momentum equation. So the amount of time that moments are applied, forces uh, at offset of some moment arm, will cause a change in the angular momentum. So now we have uh, the impulse angular momentum equation form. Remember, just the same, same. they spring right from F equals MA and, uh, and the sum of the torques, some of the moments, as we call it in this class. Okay, not, not as intuitive as F equals MA is, but we'll, uh, we'll also keep it, uh, keep it a little more straightforward. So let's do a little piece of it. Uh, here's a, uh, a circular piece of track. And a mass is sliding down that track such that when it gets to a certain point there that will define with which angle? This angle. This is a circular track of radius r. When it gets to a certain point theta it's got a velocity v at that instant. So just to get used to what we're doing here, find the angular momentum at that instant. Let's find the uh, the uh, acceleration at that instant as well. Tangential acceleration. The angular acceleration is just going to be the or the, the radial acceleration is just going to be uh, v squared over r. So 
at some point theta, it's got some velocity v, find then the uh, angular momentum. R doesn't change, so that's rather easy. In fact, because of the uh, perpendicular nature of these two quantities, then this is just R M V. But remember, this is a vector, so. Uh, I guess taking our usual convention that clockwise into the board is negative, this would be minus RMVK, nothing more than that. So that's the angular momentum about 0.0. Let's see. Uh, it's acceleration at that instant. Let's see. Ex tangential acceleration, if you remember, is the time rate of change of the velocity, is it not? Because the velocity itself is always tangential. There's no normal component to the velocity at any time. So if we're looking for V dot, well, we have. Uh, well, we almost have part of it. I've erased most of it, but it comes from uh, our new form of this equation. Remember where this was r cross m v dot itself so right there. So there's the v dot we're looking for. In two dimensions, this is a lot easier. We don't even really need the vector form because uh, uh, it's either into or out of the board. We automatically know which. So that that h dot zero, this we've already got. Uh, from here, we just need to take the dot product of it. We've got the minus sign implying that it's clockwise, which is our normal convention. So the sum of the moments, that's a little bit different. Uh, in the, well, just in that we don't have it up there yet. So let's put it up there. There's the weight of the object. And there's the normal force exerted by the track, which is, of course, perpendicular to the, the track and V itself. And it's the sum of the moments caused by these two forces. Those are the only two forces in the problem. We're assuming uh, a smooth track, no friction. How much moment exerted by the normal force? None. I mean none. The normal force goes right through the origin, so it's not going to exert any moment about the origin. So we only have to concern ourselves with that part of the weight that's exerting any uh, moment. And so let's see, that's uh, mg is the weight. This moment arm here, let me move that. R, just so it's not confusing, that's of course the radius. 
this is the moment our maybe we'll call it D. That was, uh, I think, fairly typical in physics one. What's that length? Uh, this, these, both these angles are theta. So that's R sine theta. So this is MGR sine theta, but that's also in the negative direction. So those two parts are equal. Minus signs cancel. R cancels. M cancels. We get no, it's not vector, because we know automatically from inspection that it's that it's uh, uh, clockwise uh, minus m r all cancel g sine theta is all this left. Simple start, I hope. I can tell first day after spring break you're ready for something bigger. All right, so let's uh, apply it to something else uh, in the impulse momentum form of that very same business. So let's say we've got a little gizmo here. Here's a, a little pulley there on an axle. And we're going to pull on that pulley as the axle causes a uh, gizmo to spin, so it's kind of like uh, there we go. All right, so we're going to pull on that force, causing that to spin. This is a very same type of thing that is done when a satellite is spun up to speed so that it can be uh, released from the space station or the space shuttle. Uh, they give it a, a, a spin, an angular spin, to uh, help stabilize it. So this is the very type of thing they might do, spin it up to speed. Probably something a little more complex than uh, one of the astronauts pulling on the, on the string there. But that's the idea. So put some uh, numbers to this. Each of those pieces is three kilograms. The arms are very slender, four hundred millimeters. The radius there of the, the pulley is 100 millimeters and uh, the force T is 20 newtons. Alright, so that's the basic setup. Okay, your, your spring break addled brains can see that. Jake? No, Jake's just thinking, man, I haven't eaten for 20 minutes after the endless buffet. Yeah. Did you put on any weight? Yeah, I did. <laughs> okay. Alright. <laughs> Here's the other information. Starts from rest. And some amount of time later that you need to find.
find t such that its final angular speed is 150 RPM. And then if that's a satellite and that's what we, the speed we wanted on it, uh, that's the time we release it. All right. Uh, six times involved. Maybe you're thinking that uh, application of the impulse, angular impulse momentum equation might work. And you'd be right. side, the impulse side, is fairly straightforward. In fact, even more so if we look straight on to this pulley. If we see the pulley like that with this 20 newton force at some moment arm, then you see that the impulse is 20 newtons times a radius of 0.1 meters. Uh, we typically work with newton meters. And then times some unknown time t that you're defined. That's going to cause a change in angular momentum. We're here now. I've uh, left off the vector signs because it's a two-dimensional problem when you look right down the axle itself. So it's a matter of finding then the change in angular momentum. I'll do half of it for you. Colin, you want me to do more than that? What's the initial angular momentum? It's what? Zero. Zero. It's not, nothing's moving. There's no velocity, angular or otherwise. So there's my contribution. Colin at first didn't think it'd be enough, now he realizes that was a huge chunk of the problem. He's willing to take off the rest. So, uh, if we can find this second angular momentum, then it'll be a straightforward matter of finding, finding then uh, the amount of time t that we need to apply this 20 newton force. Apply it more than that, gets more speed, less than that, it'll have less speed. We want it to have 150 RPM at release. So, your duty is to find that final angular momentum. Assume that this pulley has uh, insignificant mass compared to the rest of the system. Because it, it, that too, and, and the axle as well, all needs to be spun up to speed as well. But uh, we're worried mostly about the, the contraption at the back. So what do you think the angular momentum of this system with a very slender axle, slender, nearly massless arms, and a, a small pulley at the front.
later in the class will take into account the size of all of those things. Right now we're still looking at particle dynamics. Remember angular momentum Be, uh, we find it that way. I don't know if that's any help. Yeah, no, everybody seems busy. No, it's a cat. That's daydreaming. Cat wants to go shovel. You're going to get your wish come through there, Pat. Still snowing. 60 degrees last week. Take what I'm here and missed it. What was it where you were? What do you think we're using for the this reference? Oh. That's right down the shaft because everything's turning around that. What then is R? R would be the 400 millimeters. M, well you've got that. What about V? Is that the uh, angular velocity? It's V, right. which is not angular velocity. That's linear velocity. Remember, this is the this little piece right here itself is the linear momentum. Yeah. Do we take the 150 rpm to make it revolutions per second, and then turn that into radians per second, and then multiply that? Then what? Multiply that by the uh, 0.4 meters to get the velocity. At any instant, you've got these little masses at some distance r and as drawn it's going to spin that way such that it'll have some velocity. That velocity is directly related to the angular speed omega. I 
Uh-huh. Oh, I think I only need one. Okay. What's that cross product become? Just time. Becomes what? It's since since those two vectors, R and V, are perpendicular, it's just the magnitude, R and V. However, what were you saying about the masses? There's four of them. They're all the same distance away, they're all moving at the same speed, they're all connected. Yeah, but each one contributes. So you have to multiply that total times four. This is the total angular momentum. If we, if we wish, we can put a, a, a summation sign in front of it there. And then V, we now know to be R omega. Did I give you omega? You know, what, I, what I gave you is operating frequency, which is not the same as omega. Omega, remember, is angular velocity in radians per second. Did you okay? Colin? You got it? No? Did you talk to GJ about what he had? Did you agree? TJ, that was good. Make him get up, move, because he's more well rested than the rest of us, because we've been shoveling ice for two weeks. Yeah. Pat, that help? Yeah. A little bit? Yeah. Bobby? Stuck somewhere? You're what? I still don't know how to get up there. Ah, that's a good one. Find some help. Alex, you stuck somewhere? Oh, you want to check this answer? I didn't understand this question. I didn't understand. You didn't understand whose question? Yeah, this question. Bobby, about if he, so he's stuck with omega, because this is not omega, is it? Oh, I think it's Oh, oh, negative. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Cool. Yeah. All right. So, Bobby Omega is that operating frequency. However, when we use Omega, do you remember what the units were for it? Yeah, radians per second. So we need to turn revolutions into radians. There's two pi radians for every revolution. Once around is two pi radians. So we have radians per minute and we need to make that into seconds. Yeah, I got you. And I don't know if I have that number separately, do I? Yeah, I don't have to have that number separately. I just figured out the velocity straight up. Oh yeah, I do, 15.7 radians per second. So we've got R, M, and omega now. The four, remember, is because there are four of them and you should get then what for the final angular momentum. Oh, by the way, since this is, I have it written in vector form, then uh, keep it in vector form. It doesn't really matter because we're looking for the time. What's this equal? Anybody have this separately? Units are what? Units are what? Yep. Or 
kilogram meter squared per second. Then you can, uh, that goes in here, and you solve for T. The total time it takes to, to bring this thing up to speed from rest, 15.1 seconds. That's what you got, right? Alex, you got that too, good job. What would make that time longer? Do what? Heavier masses. Longer, Bigger masses. Longer arms. Longer arms. Both. Uh, more masses. Anytime they add something to uh, a satellite, all this calculation has to be done. Uh, all that has to be done again uh, to, to get things just right as the sizes and the masses change for these things. In a smaller force. What? In a smaller force. Smaller force or a smaller radius or both, all of those things affect it. Okay. Maybe another satellite type problem. Uh, a uh, uh, some kind of slender linkage thing here pivoting on the center and there's a little hook on each end there those outs yeah, L for, for the length of the arms, L. Starting from rests, let's say, let's say that coming in here, is a single mass moving at some velocity 3V down here, is a double mass, 2m, moving at just a single v, whatever that quantity is. So this is this is going to be terms in, of of uh, those quantities, m, v, l. Find the final angular velocity uh, assuming it starts from rest. Okay, a couple things here, maybe a little more subtle. They'll, uh, they'll, they'll come to light as we discuss it, but uh, see what you can do with it first. final velocity of those objects because once they hit and stick to that uh, arm they're going to have the same velocity as each other and uh, uh, they're certainly going to affect each other and once we find that angular velocity or that, that, that velocity we can, we can find the final angular velocity of the system itself have some final velocity there once those stick on. Where's that going to come from? Uh, 
that can come from the final angular momentum. And that can come from the impulse angular momentum equation, which, uh, which we got a little bit ago, just a little bit ago today. So there's sort of a solution map to get you started so that we can find this final angular momentum. And it'll be, again, in terms of V and R, or not R, uh, L and M, you can figure. Momentum, angular momentum, uh, I sorry, moments and like uh, with respect to O, uh, hopefully it's pretty obvious that should be this pivot point there. Moments, uh, well, the second half here, that's what we're looking for. Uh, HF minus HO, I won't bother putting Sorry, H I. I won't call it putting O. It's about the only point where it's rotating. What's H I? No, it's not. These masses are moving with respect to that point, so they're going to have an angular momentum with respect to that point of R cross MV. So, let's see. There's two of them, so we'll add it together. I uh, won't need to worry too much about it. Obviously, it's going to be uh, counterclockwise. What's that cross product going to be? <coughs> At the instant those things hit this, then the momentum vector and the R vector are perpendicular, so it'll be just the product of the two. So the first one, R is really L here, M 3V, so 3MV. That's the angular momentum of this first little piece as it hits the arm momentum might be different some other time before it hits there, but we only care about once the instant it makes contact with the arm because that's when things start to change. What's the angular momentum of this piece? Two LMV. So there's the initial angular momentum. 
Uh, I guess to make it a vector, we'll say, okay, remember cross product is a vector equation and results in a vector. So hi magnitude is 5 lmv. That's the initial angular momentum of this. Well, what about the arms itself? Not worrying about those. They're slender. They're light, as always. Uh, later in the term, we'll take into account that that may not be the case. We have to uh, get all of this thing spinning up to speed. For right now, we're leaving those as very lightweight. All right, so there's part of it. There's the initial angular momentum. Then what? What we need is the final angular momentum. From that we'll get the uh, velocity of any one piece of them. And from that we can get the uh, angular velocity. So what's next? I have trouble seeing You mean you think they're the same? They feel the same, but I'm probably wrong. Uh, well, let's go from there. If if those are the same, then the difference is zero, and that's got to be zero then. Is that the case? Here, let's see if this doesn't help remind us. Um, we had the angular, or we had the impulse momentum equation for linear uh, linear momentum, right? Looked like that. What was this quantity? Some of what forces? Huh? External forces, applied forces. When somebody reaches in and pushes it, or shoves it, or pulls on that rope. What moments are these? The moments caused by those very same forces. The applied forces causing some applied moment. What applied moment do we have here? There are none. There, there. There are no applied external forces. There are no applied external moments. There would be if the bearings here were rusty, dragged a lot, or if we had a motor attached there that was helping spin the thing, or we had some brakes on there that trying to slow it down or something. Then we'd have some kind of applied moment. But in this case, we have no applied moment. So the impulse, remember that's this side, the angular impulse is zero. So we have conservation of angular momentum. Because the change in momentum itself is uh, zero. So it's conservation of angular momentum. No applied torques, no applied moments. No angular acceleration. So then what? Final angular momentum. See, 
this is this is uh, that quantity V. When they hit, will they be moving with that same velocity? No, they'll they'll have some other velocity um, when they hit. So uh, we have to figure out what that is. The first piece, which has mass m, is a distance l. So R m v will be R l m, and then whatever the second velocity is. We don't know what that is yet. So this will be l m v two. But that v two, I guess v f. V f is what we need to find final angular velocity. So, I'm going to be consistent put an F in there. What's the angular velocity of this piece once it's stuck to the arm? L 2M VF. it hits and sticks and is now moving with velocity Vf and they're both going to have to move at the same velocity because they're both stuck to the same arm. At that instant its momentum is R M V. The fact that this was a 3 is going to have a, an effect on this one. You can figure that uh, momentum is going to transfer from one to the other. I'm not sure which one's, well, the, uh, this one has more angular momentum than this one does. In the end, though, um, we're left with the same. So what's that? 3LMVF. So we can solve for Vf because these two are equal. M's cancel, L's cancel. We're left with what? Five thirds. Five thirds V. Is that right? And then remember that V equals L omega F. Sorry, VF equals L omega F. So L omega F equals five-thirds the original velocity, uh, well, the original velocity uh, uh, factor. This one was moving V, this was moving three times that. Do the, uh, do the units work out? Yeah, the units work out. This will have see, meters per second divided by meters is per seconds, radians per second. So it works out. All right, so we have conservation of angular momentum when there are no external moments. Just like we had conservation of linear momentum when there were no external forces. Questions on that one? You ready for a get out of class question? Get back to spring break. All right, any questions before I erase that one? Pat, okay with that? Yeah. Alex, comfortable with that now? Okay, like I said, this, this angular momentum is a lot more subtle. It's not nearly as intuitive as linear momentum is. It's easy to think. At times, there's no angular momentum just because nothing's turning at the time, and that's not the case. 
All right, so here's a here's another system. We have this uh, shaft rotating at uh, 20 radians per second. Of course, slender and nearly massless. On that is an arm on which slides a collar. And then at the end of this slide, there's a uh, a stop thing that kind of a of a, a sort of a plug type thing there at the end. So at the instant, that collar is at point A, which is three inches from the center. At the instance at point A, it has angular velocity 20 radians per second, and the collar is allowed to slide then to the uh, end of the arm, the lightweight arm, which is at 24 inches. find the angular speed of the system when the collar reaches point B. Okay, so it has some initial speed at which point this collar is released because there's insufficient centripetal force, it slides outward to point B. What then is the angular velocity of the system when it gets out to point B? That's your get out of class question. Picture. The picture this is my picture. While we're waiting, Jake, we can, we can do some real nice shading effects on this. What? Roll of toilet paper? You got something on your mind after a long spring break? Diet changes. These are engineers known for consistent habits to almost to the point of, of psychosis. All right, so we want to find omega two. That would certainly come from change in omega. I guess we could get it. That's going to be directly related to the change in angular momentum. Map, our, our path to 
for the truth. Grasshopper. Is that a cultural reference you guys don't get? Yeah. The path to the truth, grasshopper, you don't get that? You do? But you're just a little boy. I do. There's a show on the <coughs> 70s or 80s, I forget which, called Kung Fu with David Carradine. Oh, what was that? 70s or 80s? Oh, okay. You could have come across it in, in modern history, ancient history. Alright, so impulse momentum equation again. Again, the uh, point O about which all this is calculated would be the shaft. Uh, and that's going to see a change in angular momentum. So if we find that, then we get our change in angular velocity. And that we get the final velocity. And that's your get out of class question. Especially since I've practically solved it for you now. I'm such a nice guy. Yeah. Got it? In radians per second. That's so many steps. Sure no, no, that's right. This? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. This is probably the one and only time I'm the first problem for a class on this. Because before anybody else did. You just wrote it down once you saw you hold it up. Yep. Oh, and all of a sudden Colin has to do magic when that's over. It's exactly the same answer. Jake's now saying, oh, wait a second, this is one we can actually solve. If I'd done it, I could have been out of here. Pat, you stuck somewhere? Or can I help? Uh, not yet.